Hello and welcome to the April Visions webinar. We're pleased to have you all here with us today. Um, the title of today's webinar is What If the Grid Arrives? How Off-Grid Renewable Energy Projects Have Adapted to Grid Arrival. So we have an excellent lineup of speakers here today with us. Um, first of all, we have Carmen Dienst, who is the Visions Coordinator. Um, she's based at the Wuppertal Institute in Germany, and she's going to make a few introductory remarks on why this topic was chosen and why we find it so important. Um, next up is our first speaker um, giving a presentation will be Chris, Chris Griesen from Palang Thai. Um, we were hoping to have uh, Rebecca Leaf here today from Nicaragua, from the Association of Rural Development Workers, Benjamin Linder. Uh, we do believe there are some technical issues that are occurring, so if she's able to join us later in the webinar, um, we will certainly have her on here, but um, we're not sure she's gonna be able to join today. And then lastly, um, from IDCO, we'll have um, Janaid Tazdik, um, who's the IDCO Assistant Manager for the Solar Home System Program. Um, and we have as well Mafruda Rahman, who's from the Green Climate Fund, uh, but is also a colleague of Junaid's. Um, so we're pleased to have all of these speakers here with us today. Um, we are stretching from the, uh, the Pacific Coast today all the way to Bangladesh, so covering about uh, 12 or 13 hours of time zones there. Um, each speaker or team of speakers will have about uh, 12 minutes for a brief presentation, um, and then we'll move into the discussion after those initial presentations. Um, just a few quick reminders today. Uh, we invite you to send your questions to the speakers. Audience participation is really important to the success of this webinar, so we'll look forward to your questions. Um, and when you send those in, please let us know which speaker your question is for, who you would like to um, give a response to your question, and, and we'll try to cover as many of those as possible in the discussion today. Um, we also invite you to give us your feedback via a survey at the very end of the webinar. So when the webinar ends, it's not completely the end. We'd love to have your feedback. We'd love to know what you thought about it today, um, both from a content perspective or from a technical perspective, um, and what you'd like to see in the future, because we're really open to, to hearing from the audience and knowing um, what you'd like to hear about. So now I'm going to invite um, Carmen Dienst, uh, as I just introduced her, from Visions uh, at the Wuppertal Institute to give a few opening remarks on why we chose this topic. So um, welcome, Carmen. Yeah, hello um, to everybody. Hello, Molly. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Carmen Dienst. I'm the coordinator of Visions Initiative, um, and I'm very happy um, to welcome you on behalf of the initiative and on behalf of Wuppertal Institute to this webinar on the topic of interconnection and the question on what happens if, if the grid arrives and, and how off-grid renewable energy projects um, can adapt and have adapted in the past. What are the experiences so far? What are solutions? What are options? As uh, Molly already said, this is the second webinar of Visions in this year, and more are to follow end of May and, and June. To give you a little background on, um, on our work, um, we are located at Wuppertal Institute, which is a German think tank, uh, and which is focused on various aspects on sustainability, specifically looking at the question on how to design transition pathways to a more sustainable society. And uh, in this context uh, is also our initiative, Visions, which is existing since 2004 and uh, which has the aim to promote clean and sustainable energy solutions in developing regions. It is financially supported by Swiss-based foundation, uh, foundation Pro Evolution and, and run by the Institute. So our work of, uh, of Visions is focused on local practitioners level and we try to help local partners to, to identify the right and, and optimal clean solution for energy needs. And how do we do this? We, we do this with, by so supporting implementation projects. Up to now we, we have supported 110 projects. But what is more is that we try to promote and ensure exchange of experiences, exchange of experiences of local practitioners. And for example, we do this in supporting regional networks, um, which have been in the focus actually of the first webinar, um, which has been recorded and can also be um, 
uh, looked at in, in, on our webpage. Um, so in the context of the networks, their exchanges and the projects, we see the, which topics are crucial for work, uh, for the work on the ground and which challenges are faced by the implementing organizations. And, and this is why we have chosen for today the topic and grid arrival definitely is, is an issue for NGOs and partner organizations uh, with which we work together and um, where we supported projects, uh, sometimes now the, the grid has arrived. And um, so it's it's a crucial thing and, and it's important to have a discussion on this. Um, and especially this came up in, in the network, which is active in South and Southeast Asia, uh, the, the Hydro Empowerment Network, a uh, network active on uh, MHPs. And they identified this as important topic for their members. And this is why Visions has supported about two years ago, a practice to policy workshop in Sri Lanka. And um, maybe some of you have, have joined um, one year, about one year ago, they have done a webinar on this topic, but with special focus on Asia and MHP in cooperation with Energypedia and SCAT. Um, so Visions would like to, to link to this exchange of experiences in the networks and also to the work that has uh, done before and give it a, a little broader picture, uh, give a little broader picture on the topic. And uh, therefore we invited uh, speakers from different regions and different technology contexts um, as Molly said, unfortunately, uh, most likely Rebecca from Nicaragua will not uh, able to join, but but still, it's it's a broader perspective that we try to give here. So, as we you will see in the presentations um, to come, the questions and also possible solutions are are complex and not one dimensional, uh, and there are pros and cons. Um, of, of different solutions so we can so we hope that we can make a little contribution to the ongoing discussion on the topic and hope you will enjoy the webinar and as molly said we invite you to um either ask your questions by writing or uh, in the chat or sending us the feedback thank you thank you so much carmen yeah absolutely um and and as you're saying i mean um, it, today is a great opportunity to promote another exchange of experience, and I know we've got people joining from around the globe. So speaking of joining from around the globe, we'd like to do a quick poll. Um, we want to make sure the audience is feeling involved and that you're you're awake and uh, ready to uh, ready to participate today. So let me just launch this first poll. Um, and what I'd like to ask you is where you're located. So are you somewhere in Africa? perhaps somewhere in South or Southeast Asia, um, in other parts of Asia, so China perhaps, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, or perhaps Europe and North America. So we'll give you just a few more seconds. I see about half the people have voted. So um, if you haven't voted on here before, it should, should be there on your screen enabling you to vote. Um, and great, so I'm just going to go ahead and close the poll. So any last uh, last people who want to vote, go for it. Okay, so now I'm going to close the poll and we will see everybody's responses. Uh, let me just share that with you. So you should be able to see that we have um, about 19% of our, uh, our attendees today are in Africa, 31% in South or Southeast Asia, Wow, it must be late for you guys. Thank you for joining in um, in other parts of Asia as well. Excellent. And in Europe and North America. So uh, good morning to everybody in North America um, and uh, and here in Europe. It's a late afternoon. So great. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to do another uh, quick poll here at the beginning. Um, and we just want to know why you're interested in this topic. So let me just post that one up for you as well. So are you interested in the grid arrival topic as perhaps as an energy practitioner um, facing grid interconnection issues yourself? Or maybe you're an energy practitioner who has a general interest in the topic. Maybe you're also a researcher, or perhaps a student working on these issues or a policymaker or working for an NGO. And lastly, we have other, that's a bit of a catch all that could be private sector consultant um, or just somebody who has an interest in this topic and who cares who cares about uh, renewable energy in developing countries. So I see almost 
everyone has voted. Any last votes? We'll, we'll get your votes in there. We want to make sure you're counted in our democratic process today. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for exercising your right to vote here in the webinar. Let me share that with you as well, just so we can see. All right, we've got a really diverse makeup. So 11% of your energy practitioners who are actually facing these issues, 22% have a general interest in the topic, 22% also are researchers, 33% are from policy or NGOs and other, we've got about 11%. So thank you, thank you everybody for making up uh, such a wonderful and diverse audience today. Um, so I would like to move directly into our first presentation, and this is going to be from Chris Greeson. I'm just going to send you through the, um, the request to share your screen, Chris. Thanks for joining us here today. Hi. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you. I think the screen is on its way up. Let me see if I can pull out my presentation here. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Is Wonderful. that working? Can you see yeah, that, Yeah, that's Molly? working very well. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay Great. Thank you. Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Um, I'm in the West Coast enjoying a beautiful frosty sun, sunrise over here. Um, and I uh, just want to get my slides so I can actually see them. Sorry. Um, well, in many countries, rural electrification is proceeding on, on kind of a two-prong approach. On the one hand, there's off-grid approaches that can provide electricity quicker um, and often can provide uh, local economic opportunities for people that work in, on the off-grids. And, um, and on the other hand, the grid is expanding and, and can provide electricity that is, uh, can power generally larger appliances and, and sometimes is, is less costly. And the question that we're going to be looking at is how can the off-grid and on-grid solutions be harmonized and, and reduce wasted investment? And before we start, I just want to mention a little bit about my background. I was um, in my teens and 20s in the 1980s and early 90s, I, I worked on household scale renewable energy systems as, a, as an installer and, and designer and also as an author and illustrator at a, at a magazine here in the United States called Home Power, uh, which at that point was mostly doing renewable energy systems for the market was mostly off-grid, uh, back to the land, hippies and, and so forth. And, and now the, the world's really changed <laughs> quite, a, quite a bit in that, in that the market has expanded hugely. Uh, when I was around 20, I, I learned of Ben Linder's work in Nicaragua, and so I was really excited to um, that we might be joining the forum with with uh, Rebecca from from uh, continuing Ben Linder's work there. Uh, he was working on community microhydropower, and uh, and I hadn't really heard about it before, and 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 inspired by that, I, I volunteered to do some work in Ladakh in northern India for an NGO that was building community microhydropower projects. And I was really amazed by how much uh, useful services are, are really comparatively small compared to the system sizes in America for a single home, that, that what could power a single home in, in the United States could power a whole village and, and, and how much more useful that was. Um, so it's a really big um, honor to be part of this forum. And I'm looking forward to meeting Rebecca at some point, um, if not on this forum at, at, at some point. Um, I, I wrote my PhD dissertation about 15 years ago about dozens of community microhydropower projects in northern Thailand that were being abandoned when and, and generally because of the arrival of the national grid. And out of this research um, came some work helping Thailand draft some regulations that would allow these and other customer-owned renewable energy projects to connect to the main grid. And I can't say that the regulations stopped the demise of many of the microhydropower projects in Thailand, but they did enable thousands of megawatts of other renewables to, to connect to the grid. Um, let me also mention these days, I'm, I'm working a lot with the World Bank, uh, the SMAP program uh, on the global facility on mini grids. And there's a couple of publications that we've done that might be of interest. Um, and I've 
put URLs on at the bottom of the screen for both of them. They're, they're both downloadable um, for free. Uh, one of them is a, a book called From the Bottom Up, How Small Power Producers and Mini Grids Can Deliver Electrification and Renewable Energy in Africa. Um, that's available in English and, and French at that URL. And then on the right, a book that uh, is called Mini Grids and the Arrival of the Main Grid, which is specifically addressing the topic that we're talking about today, that looks at specifically at Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia, which are three countries that have really been pioneers in one way or another in uh, interconnecting formerly isolated mini grids. Um, just a very, my, my slides are going to be kind of a, a primer for the discussion. Um, some of this may be really basic material uh, and, and some uh, may be useful for participants that are a little bit new to the topic. So just um, when we talk about off-grid electricity, really kind of break it down into two different, uh, two different types. One is village scale or, or mini grid. So a mini grid would comprise a generation source and, and a distribution network to one or more villages typically. And then there's more household, household scale solutions like solar home systems. And in these slides, I'm mostly gonna be focusing on the mini grid and its arrival of the grid options. Um, I'm really ha happy that Junaid uh, Tadzik from Bangladesh is here and will be touching on more of the solar home system household scale side of things. So we've really observed so far six different possibilities that arise for mini grids when the main grid arrives. Uh, and I'll go through these in, in more details, but the first one is a small power distributor. The second is a small power producer. The third is a combination of both of these things. The fourth option would be separate systems in the same village. So the national grid is there and the mini grid is also providing electricity. Uh, the next would be purchase by the utility of the assets of the mini grid. And finally, the uh, not so great solution of the assets being abandoned. So I'm going to show these using this simple schematic. This one shows kind of before the arrival of the grid on the left hand side, we've got the national grid uh, serving customers generally powered by centralized large power plants. And then separate from that, um, mini grids providing electricity to uh, customers based on, on small generation, micro hydropower or solar uh, biomass are, are, are the most common, or diesel. Um, and as the main grid arrives, one option that we're seeing is the conversion to what we call a small power distributor, or sometimes it's called a distribution franchisee. So the idea is that the small power producer um, that, that the mini grid abandoned its, its generation, but it keeps its distribution network and becomes a local small distribution power company purchasing electricity at wholesale from the national grid and reselling that electricity. Uh, so it keeps its customers, but it stops having its generation. And Cambodia is probably the biggest example of this. Um, in the 1980s and, and, and late 70s, when Cambodia was going through a civil war, the electrification really stalled and kind of went backwards. And, uh, and as they, the country emerged from the civil war, um, many small communities started uh, doing their own generation because they couldn't really count on the government to provide um, electricity for them. And so we had hundreds of small diesel powered mini grids. And over, uh, as Cambodia kind of came out of its civil war and, 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 and electrification started uh, really in earnest, the, the country decided to focus its resources on expanding the medium voltage network. Um, and they adopted a model where it would, uh, sell electricity to these, these what had been mini grids and uh, encourage their conversion from being mini grids to being uh, small power distributors and, and reselling the electricity. 
And in the Cambodia case, uh, that, that worked out well for customers because the diesel generated electricity was quite expensive, but under this new model, they could purchase the electricity at wholesale at, at lower cost than generating it themselves. And then in Cambodia, they've set up a system where uh, the tariff is, is actually standardized and there's a cross subsidy that comes from customers in larger cities in Phnom Penh um, and helps uh, pay for the electricity in these rural areas, which is more expensive. This option of, of becoming a small power uh, distributor seems to work best in the case of diesel generators where you have it's real where it's quite expensive to generate your own electricity but where the generator itself is not worth that much so abandoning and abandoning the generator isn't such a big deal uh, small power distributors in one form or another are also found in in Nepal um, in Bangladesh you might characterize some of the rural co-ops as small power distributors and Burkina Faso is another country that's that's uh, had them as well. Next option would be becoming a small power producer. So in this case, that would mean no longer operating the distribution network, but operating the, the, the generation as a small power plant that sells electricity just to the national grid. And where we see this happening particularly is for systems that use hydropower, which can generate electricity at fairly low cost, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and having that ability to have an off taker that can take that electricity all the time uh, works, works well. Um, in a couple of countries that we've been seeing this mm, take off, beginning to take off perhaps is a better way of putting it, is, is in Sri Lanka. Um, Originally, there were over 250 micro hydro projects that were built as part of a, a, a collaborative process between the, the World Bank and uh, local developers. Um, and with the arrival of the grid, unfortunately, most of these have been abandoned, but three projects have successfully connected to become small power producers. And there's another five that are in the pipeline. And these only sell electricity to the national grid and the national grid exclusively services the households and the villages. Related to this, there's another publication that I, I just draw your attention to uh, that deals with the technical aspects of interconnecting uh, small hydropower projects and other projects with rotating generation. It's also downloadable for free. It's called a guidebook on grid interconnection and islanded operation of mini grid power systems up to 200 kilowatts. And it, is published by the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the United States and goes into the um, relays and, and issues around synchronizing these small projects and then going back to islanded operation. Another option that, that combines kind of the best of, of both the SPP and SPD is to be both at the same time. So uh, you have a, a mini grid that's producing electricity for sale to retail customers. And when it has extra electricity, for example, a micro hydropower project in the middle of the night, that sells that excess to the national grid. Um, but there might be times, especially if the village loads are growing, where there's not enough electricity coming from the micro hydro, and then it purchases electricity from, from the national grid. And, uh, Indonesia is a country where some of these have started to happen of about 200 community owned micro hydro mini grids that were built over the years. Uh, so far, nine have become SPPs that are selling either all or, or some of their electricity to the national grid. There's a really great project also in, in Tanzania, a four megawatt hydropower project called Mwenga that does this and, and sells electricity to about 1,500 households and then also sells electricity to a tea estate and, and, and to the national utility, Tenesco. Another option is what we call coexistence. So the national grid arrives, but the, the uh, mini grid doesn't really stop what it's doing. It continues to serve um, some or, or maybe even all of the customers that it had been serving and people just have 
duplicate sets of, of wires and, and a transfer switch in their house. And so this particularly happens in countries where the national grid might be inexpensive, but it also is not very reliable. Um, so for example, in Uttar Pradesh in, in India, uh, a number of mini grids operate in this fashion. The um, a company called OMC has actually been building some mini grids in uh, solar powered mini grids in villages that had electricity already from the national grid, but the electricity, the lines uh, were only kind of intermittently energized. The next option is it would be the, the buyout option where the national utility purchases the assets uh, or some of the assets from the, from the mini grid. And right now there are regulations that are on the books that have been approved for this in Tanzania and in Nigeria, and I believe in, in Sierra Leone, I'm not positive about that one, that provide for mini grids to be compensated when the national grid arrives. In the case of Tanzania, uh, it's only the distribution network and it has to be built to main grid standards and the, um, the amount compensated is the depreciated value of the distribution network. In the case of Nigeria, it's, it also includes the depreciated value of the generator itself, um, solar plant or, or hydropower project or whatever, um, as well as, as the previous 12 months of revenue from the, from the, the project. Um, I should mention that as far as I know, compensation hasn't yet happened. So these are regulations that are on the books. I don't think that the utilities have yet actually uh, had the opportunity to, to make the payment and, and assume ownership of the assets in these countries yet. And then finally, uh, there's the option of, <laughs> the not so great option of the assets being abandoned. And this is unfortunately, when we've done research on, on what's happening in, in the countries that we looked at, particularly uh, Sri Lanka and Indonesia, uh, when the main grid arrives in Thailand as well, um, the mini grids have been abandoned. Um, this is this is something that some mini grid operators are finding ways to protect against in in interesting ways. For example, solar mini grid developers are are more more often than well, sometimes increasingly building their systems into shipping containers that can be easily picked up and, and moved so that when the main grid arrives, they can find another village that's farther away from the grid and, and reset up their business there. So that's an overview of the different types of modalities we, we've been seeing on the ground uh, with the arrival of the grid and, and these mini grids. Uh, the documents that I mentioned, as well as my PhD dissertation that addresses this issue in, in Northern Thailand um, are all available at this uh, website address, palangthai.wordpress.com slash docs. Uh, so with that, I'll um, turn it back to the organizers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, that was an excellent, uh, excellent way to kind of set the scene and let people know, you know, um, what these different options can be. Um, and I've just had some good news, um, which is Rebecca Leaf. Um, you know, I know you were just mentioning in your presentation how inspirational Benjamin Linder had been to your own work um, in off-grid energy. So Rebecca was actually able to join us, which is fantastic. Um, as mentioned to to you all, um, she is on a off-grid connection so she is sometimes going offline and online but we're hoping to have her in here as our third presentation so next up though we are going to turn to bangladesh um, and i hope that's fine janide um, tazdik is going to be our first presenter and he'll be followed by his colleague mafruda rahman um, each of them will be talking for six minutes about the work that they've been doing um, so what i'm going to do is just send um, send a sharing screen request to uh, Janaid. Um, hi, Janaid, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So you should get a pop-up on your screen, 
And exactly, wonderful. So you're already full screen. So I just want to say thank you for joining us here today. Um, I know it's late in the evening, uh, Bangladesh time, but we're very, very interested to hear about this case study um, and particularly about your work on solar home systems and also a little bit on mini grids. So with that, I will let you go directly into your presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Molly. Uh, I will be uh, focusing on what happens when the grid comes, uh, challenges by off-grid renewable uh, space by off-grid renewable energy projects. Uh, today we will be presenting the case study of Bangladesh. Uh, I'm uh, Junat Tazdik, working as an assistant manager uh, under Solar Home System Program, uh, Renewable Energy Department of uh, Infrastructure Development Company Limited. Uh, with me, I have um, Smafuda Rahman, uh, working as an assistant manager and uh, working under the Renewable Energy Project. Uh, at first, let me give you an overview of uh, what it call is, what it call is doing. Uh, it call is uh, basically a fully government owned financial institution and it started its operation in 1997 and it's also the largest financier uh, in private sector infrastructure projects in Bangladesh and also market leader in renewable energy sector in Bangladesh. Uh, funded by the government and multiple development partners like World Bank, uh, ADB, Zika, IDB, KFW, ZIZ, and other uh, donor fund. And uh, we have uh, a total of uh, 362 employees. Uh, we have 117 in our head office and the remaining in the regional offices for monitoring purposes. And uh, some of the renewable energy activities we are involved in uh, is, uh, as you know, we have uh, our flagship project uh, program named uh, the Solar Home System Program. We have installed already 4.1 million solar home system uh, around uh, Bangladesh. Uh, we have also, uh, we have a biogas plant program and uh, we have some uh, mini grid projects, some solar irrigation farms, uh, biogas based power projects and also some uh, uh, biomass based power pro plants. And uh, for the energy efficiency initiatives, uh, it call uh, focuses on basically the green brick program, the industrial energy efficiency, and the improved cook stove program. Uh, the, uh, first, uh, let me uh, talk about the it called solar home system program. Uh, now, it called solar home system program. At a glance, you can see uh, we have a target of uh, installing six million solar home systems by uh, 2021. And until now, we have uh, installed around 4.13 million solar home systems, uh, which actually uh, uh, benefic uh, which have uh, beneficiaries of around 18 million and covering about 12% of the population in off-grid areas of Bangladesh. And uh, the sizes of uh, the solar home system under our program basically falls into 10 watt peak to 130 watt peak uh, with a power generation of approximately 150 megawatts and uh, it saves around uh, 200,000 ton of uh, fossil fuel per year. And around 75,000 people uh, are, uh, have been working under this program, uh, directly or indirectly, uh, with an equal investment of around 700 million US dollar. And uh, let me show you uh, the program structure in a brief. Uh, uh, it's called uh, as financing the partner organization, we call them partner organization who are actually implementing the program on field to the households. And uh, before installing, they have to uh, actually uh, go to the enlisted suppliers so, who are uh, enlisted by the technical standards committee, which is an independent committee. And after getting uh, the enlistment, the suppliers can pro provide the uh, equipments uh, used under the solar system program to the POs. And POs are uh, selected uh, through a PO selection committee. And uh, uh, as you can see in the uh, structure, the POs install the whole house, uh, system, uh, system in the household and they provide grant and loan and other financial support from ITCOL, which ITCOL actually gets from uh, uh, various donors and government of Bangladesh. And this, this is a basic structure of the solar home system program. Uh, if we have time uh, during our question and answer session, then we can cover more if you want to listen. Okay, and then, uh, what are the success factors behind our uh, this solar home system program, uh, which have uh, which installed around 4.13 million solar home system? Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, point out the innovative financing structure that uh, presents the ownership model. Actually, the customers become the owners of the system after three years or after paying off the installments. 
uh, then also the financial contribution of all parties, uh, like from the donors, from the government of Bangladesh, uh, from each call, even from the POs, and also the customer has to pay uh, for the system. So it, 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 there's a contribution from all the parties. And also the business model is a sust uh, sustainable. Uh, so that's just, uh, one of the factors behind the success. And also the cost efficient standardized technical design and the quality control and after service of the program, uh, development of local support industries uh, throughout this program. Also, the Bangladesh's uh, microfinance experience uh, till now, and also support from the government and different multilateral donors. And as you can see, the ERY installation of solar home system. And there's an interesting uh, thing uh, in, you can see uh, in 2013, there was the highest installation under this program, but then uh, gradually actually uh, uh, get down. Uh, we'll discuss it later. Uh, or reason behind this uh, fall of the installation diagram. And what are the challenges behind this program? Uh, is there is a, a solar system market uh, grown uh, outside the ITCOL program, and this is also is a result of the success of ITCOL solar system program that many outsiders and many other suppliers and project implementers were interested to uh, give solar home system and uh, do the business and also uh, the free distribution of the solar home system under the safety net program of the government uh, is uh, is another reason uh, uh, is uh, behind the fall of this installation pattern and today's focus as we are uh, discussing the rapid expansion of the REB grid uh, which actually results in uh, difficulty in attracting new customers uh, then poor collection from the existing customers and also lack of system maintenance, which leads to inactive system. These are the actual challenges faced uh, due to the grid expansion. And what we are doing, uh, what each call is doing and uh, what are our steps for mitigating uh, these uh, these problems. Uh, first of all, uh, we are uh, we have now engaged the, our own partner organization in the safety net programs of the government. And also there are some initiatives for product or business diversification behind the solar system also. And uh, the uh, main in, in, uh, initiatives or actions taken in case of the arrival of grid, uh, actually you can see that uh, equal POs are strictly advised not to install any system in location uh, with uh, active grid connection and also select their customers carefully. Uh, but there's a policy if the grid connection installed uh, after three months from the installation date of solar system, then we consider it as uh, not consider it as grid connected and the BOs will get the fi financial support. It could also sign an MOU with the Rural Electrification Board, REB, which is a government body and they are responsible for the grid expansion. Uh, while it ensured uh, that before giving electricity connection to any existing solar system customer of a PO, uh, REB has to ensure that uh, through their Pollibidu Shomiti, uh, working under REB, obtains a confirmation from that PO working in that area that the customer has already paid all the dues owed to the PO. Uh, so, uh, so no customer can get the grid connection uh, unless they have paid off their uh, installments. Also, REB uh, will not provide new electricity connection to a solar customer. Uh, that has payment overdue as notified by the respective PO. So these are some uh, the mitigation measures we are taking uh, for uh, the arrival of grid uh, in the solar home system. Uh, that's all from my side for the solar home system. Now my colleague, Ms. Mafruda, will discuss about the solar mini grid projects and the impacts of uh, grid arrival. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. So as you're aware that the government of the Bangladesh has set a target of providing access to electricity to all by 2020. So there, is a, there will be a huge requirement uh, from generation of electricity from all sources. However, the power system development being highly capital intensive, it is imperative that a massive investment is available to achieve the vision of the government. It will be very difficult for the government alone to provide the required fund for the development of the sector. Recognizing this, the government has formulated the energy policy, which provides scope for private investment in power generation and distribution, supplementing the pub public sector in Bangladesh. And this is where this whole mini grid comes in. 
So I will not uh, discuss in detail about the program structure. Uh, if you are interested, maybe we can discuss it later through an email or through other modality. Uh, so currently, let me just briefly explain here that the sponsor here, uh, just like the Solar Home System program, where it was mentioned PO or the partner organization for the projects we say for sponsors were the borrowers uh, from ITCOL. They're responsible for identifying the suitable uh, sites, procurement equipment from suppliers, ensure installation and commission of the plant, and after implementation, they also sell electricity to the end consumer at a specific rate. So the sponsor is required to retain a technical consultant for providing the design, supervision, and other technical supports to the um, technical supports required for the projects but however if a sponsor has adequate technical capacity they also can do it by themselves it call here basically provides soft loan grant and technical support as well as project development support to ensure that the project is implemented properly and they also there is the suppliers who ensures that all the required equipments such as uh, and machineries like the solar PV panel inverter batteries are also available to the sponsors and of course, they are the donors who are providing us with grants and uh, soft credits so that this project can be successful. So currently, the project has faced a lot of challenges and we have learned a lot of lessons among them. Uh, uh, the first of being is the adequate of technical support in the private sector. Of course, uh, this renewable energy is a very, I would rather say it's still in a very de developing uh, stage in Bangladesh. Uh, unlike India, we are not um, so much advanced and technical experts in the industry who can provide technical support in such areas are very limited. However, we are encouraging uh, many engineering institutions to uh, help us on this. There's also a lack of proven technology. So what happened with the solar uh, first solar minigit project was that it um, uh, when it was first implemented in 2010, uh, other sponsors came, uh, no other sponsors actually came forward with Minigit projects immediately after the commercial operation of the project, uh, unless seeing the viability of the project. Therefore, the successful track record of the project for four years, along with lessons learned from the project, have built confidence in the private sector to undertake the subsequent projects. So this is a, like a really uh, big time gap uh, from one project implementation to the another. And also uh, ensuring adequate financial return is a challenge because according to the financial model the solar mini grid given that the full capacity utilization is ensured within two years of the project operation the average return on the equity of the solar mini grid project is around 14 percent per annum and a payback period is about seven to eight years so this is quite a long term pay, long tenor compared to the rate of return that's gained from the in, in gain from the investment by the private sector so this uh, this is a bit of demotivating factor for them however uh, this uh, issue was also addressed by it call uh, it call ensured that the to uh, a proper a detailed market survey based on the systematic random sampling is conducted in the project areas to assess the demand for the electricity which is used for designing the plant capacity and to ensure that the rate of return can be much more enhanced and of course there's the problem of availability of quality equipment in the market and lastly, last but not the least, there's also the uh, challenges of the possibility of the grid extension. So basically, the government of the Bangladesh um, and also it called being a government owned entity had a lot of uh, pri privilege and advantage of accessing government bodies and negotiating with them regarding how the government will be dealing when uh, uh, this grid expansion will occur and many areas will be eventually covered by the grid electricity. As Mr. Chris had mentioned in his previous uh, presentation that there are various methods of exiting the market for a private investor. Uh, however, in case of Bangladesh, it's mostly the buyout model that's been proposed in the policies. And uh, hi, hi, Mafruda, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm going to come back to you in the questions because I know you've got a really important slide still after this one and we're going to give you more time. Um, but we are going to, we do have Rebecca Leaf um, who's joined us. So we will move on to her presentation now. But I want to thank uh, both you and Mr. Janaid so much for, for your presentations here. And we will come back to your last slide. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, wonderful. So, um, as mentioned, we do have um, Re Rebecca Leaf, who's joined us from Nicaragua. Hi, Rebecca. Can you hear me? And as as mentioned to the audience, we are having some some technical difficulties. So, I'm hoping quite a lot that that Rebecca will be able to hear me here. Um, I do see that she is present, but I'm not sure if her audio is working. Um, and these are the 
the, the usual challenges that one faces, of course, as you all know, working in off-grid areas. So we were quite keen to have her here, but, um, but in case we are still having some technical difficulties, um, let's see. Rebecca, can you hear me? Hmm. Yeah, I think we're still having, we're still having some challenges there. Unless she's there? No, not yet, not yet. So what I'm gonna do is, let's see, if we just wait and see if, Rebecca, is that you? Are you there? Okay, so so sorry guys. Um, what I'm gonna do is um, still try to keep uh, communicating with Rebecca and see if we can get her online. Um, I'm actually gonna pop back over to Mafruda. If that's okay with you, Mafruda, let you finish that last slide actually. Um, sorry to have got you off there. So if you can um, join me back and I'll send you back the request to share your screen. So sorry about that, um, but I'm try to keep, uh, keep things um, moving along through here. Uh, let's see. So let me just, so sorry to the audience, um, we're just getting everything straightened out here and I'm sending the request to share their screen. Okay, you should have received it now. Okay, so we'll let you go ahead and finish, okay? So two minutes. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Molly, for the time. Uh, I think uh, these these were a few uh, important slides that will actually give a, a proper um, uh, explanation about what the government is doing for promoting renewable energy in, in our country. So like I mentioned that uh, it called being a government owned entity actually had the privilege to access government more easily and negotiate with them regarding what will happen to the renewable energy projects in case the grid expansion occurs. So what the uh, it call did was uh, ensured that uh, uh, the, the power division uh, that's under the Ministry of uh, Power and Mineral Resources, they identify a few areas where uh, for sure the grid expansion will not occur. And there were like 1,024 villages that was identified and, uh, and it was defined as the off-grid areas. Uh, where the, uh, and these are the basically islands in the Hiri areas, which are isolated from the national grid network, and the, where electricity supply system does not exist, and the existing electricity supply system is inadequate, and coverage is very low, and very difficult and expensive for the government to make sure the grid electricity reaches on those sites. Uh, it call uh, also ensured that um, the government keeps its promise, and for that, uh, ensure an MOU was signed between the Rural Electrification Board and the SREDA. So SREDA is basically a government body under the Ministry of Power, Energy and Mineral Resources and coordinates the renewable energy and energy efficiency issues of the government to create a congenial environment for the private investors. And they have been helping us for a very long time regarding the implementation of the renewable energy uh, activities in Bangladesh. So also uh, the government uh, published a guideline, a guideline for the implementation of solar power development program 2013 and it mentioned that if, if grid electricity reaches the project area after five years of the construction of the plant, the government will purchase electricity from the project to ensure 15% return and this system may become connected to the grid to fit the grid with generated electricity as per uh, the arrangement between the sponsor and the government. So also this uh, this policy has very much encouraged the private sector to engage in this sector despite all the challenges and despite all the certainties because um, this was a sort of an assurance from the government side that no matter what happens, if uh, the grid expands and within five years um, the government intervention takes place on those areas, they certainly will uh, buy out electricity from them with a 15% uh, profit. So this was all from our side. Uh, if there is any question, we'll be gladly... Uh, We'll be very uh, glad to answer those. So thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. And thank you, everyone, for listening to us. Thanks so much, Mafruda. Wonderful. So I think we do have Rebecca online with us now. Hi, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Sorry, we're, we're trying. Um, so I can see that she's definitely online here. And... Yes, I can hear you, Molly. Yay! Wonderful, Rebecca. Re wonderful. We've all been really excited to have you here. Um, it was kind of amazing, actually. In the presentation of Chris, he was mentioning what an inspiration Benjamin Linder had been to him himself. So we were like, oh, we have to have Rebecca here. So you're here. Um, I know that from the slide perspective, what I can try to do is try to share 
your screen. We see if it works. If it doesn't work, because I know you have limited bandwidth there in rural Nicaragua, um, if it doesn't work, then I'll ask you to just talk through your presentation without a visual aid, if that's okay with you. So let's try first, um, and I'll see if you're able to share your screen. Um, you should receive a little pop-up message there requesting um, you to share it, and then we'll see We'll see how that goes. If it doesn't go so well, then if you don't mind just talking us through your presentation, because we're we're all super excited to hear about your your extensive experience in in Nicaragua. So just checking, um, did you receive a little pop up message asking you to share your screen? You know, I think what's probably going to be easier is actually I'm just going to leave up our our holding screen. Um, if you don't mind, Rebecca, you can start talking and please talk us through what you were going to show us. It's totally fine okay, if, if the you. visual isn't there. Thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome. Yes, I did. Just a second. I didn't have my screen ready with the presentation. Okay, in that case, I'm going to send you through the, the join, um, share your screen one more time, and let's see if, if we can get that to work. Just want to say thank you to everybody in the audience for your patience with us. I know you all understand these types of issues very well. Um, so thank you. And we'll see if we can get to get the presentation there. So did it come through, Rebecca? Okay, give me the to present my screen. You know, I, I think what's going to be easiest, because I know you have limited bandwidth, is just to talk us through it, because I think it's, um, it's, it's causing your voice to break up there. And actually, I'm not sure if, um, if your audio is still working right now. So let's see. Let's see if we can get that to work. It does look like Rebecca's audio has gone offline temporarily. Um, what we can always do is take a couple of questions from the audience to our first couple of speakers, and then we come right back to, to Rebecca. Um, and I think we'll probably have to do that one with, without slides just because of the limited bandwidth issue. But thank you again for, for all of your patience. Um, perhaps while we're just waiting for, uh, sorry, Rebecca, are you still there? Yeah, I think, sorry, her, her sound has gone offline temporarily. What I'm going to do is um, circle back around to uh, Chris, unless we can, oh, I think Rebecca's, <laughs> I think her, her audio is back. Hi, Rebecca, is, are, are you back online with us? Hi. Yes, I am. I don't seem to be able to send the screen. No, no, that's fine. What I'm going to ask you to do then is to please just take um, take your time. You have about 10 minutes here um, to present uh, what you would like to the, present from your experience in Nicaragua. Slow, but I will walk through the presentation if you're hearing me okay. I'm hearing you. Thank you, Rebecca. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you much, Molly. And everybody present. I think we are still having some sound uh, sound issues, Rebecca. Okay. But pl please uh, go ahead. Ours is a case study of a particular situation in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, the electric infrastructure is located mainly on the Pacific coast. That's where the major stations of the north. Okay, I was mentioning the Nicaragua, the electrification infrastructure is counted along the coast. 
in the large cities of Noah and they own the country. We have the major generation. In the northern and eastern parts of the country, infrastructure for rural electrification is lacking. This is where the small hydro plants can come in as a useful tool for providing electricity where the grid has not yet reached. In 2001, the Nicaraguan government uh, carried out a call for bids for a study to identify sites off-grid for rural electrification. Our organization got the job of carrying out this study and we found 30 sites at over 20 kilometers from any existing electric line where there were streams and rivers with sufficient potential to provide electricity to communities of 200 to 800 houses. The government proceeded to build eight of those projects with donated funds from Switzerland and Norway. We also had built our own small hydro plant in the northern town of Bokai which came in 1994. We noticed that there was a difference with the isolated hydro plant in the Nicaragua context because the weather pattern is characterized by a rainy and dry season pattern such that during several months of the year, it doesn't rain and the streams dry up. We lacked water for the generation that the people required. <clears throat> On the other hand, during the rainy season, there's a very large amount of rain, uh, three meters of rain per year. And we, the power plant could generate at its full capacity 24 hours a day, but the people require a small amount of electricity during the first few years. And hence the infrastructure of the, the investment in the hydro plant uh, is underutilized. The people are not requiring the energy that the plant could produce. The same has been uh, observed in the eight projects that the government built with the funding from Switzerland and Norway, that there's a large capacity in the investment of the hydro plant that goes underutilized Whereas during the dry season, there's a lack of water for generating all of the energy that the people require. These are two motives for desiring to have an intertie to the national grid. We don't see the intertie as an interference or a problem, rather as an opportunity to improve the local service during the dry season and to gain a second income by selling our excess hydro generation during the rainy season to the national grid. In the year 2000, we discovered uh, a small river in a rural community of El Qua called El Bote with a megawatt of, of hydro potential. So we decided to do this project uh, intertying it to the national grid in order to avoid the drawbacks of the isolated system, which, as I repeat, are not having enough water during the dry season and underutilizing your infrastructure during the rainy season. <clears throat> so we built the hydro plant in El Bote, uh, 900 kilowatt capacity, and we built 57 kilometers of three-phase medium voltage line 
to intertie our muni municipality to the nearest circuit of the national grid. Then we built 21 additional kilometers of three phase line to intertie El Qua, which is to the south, up to the old hydro plant in Bokai, so that that plant also would have the advantage of selling its excess hydro generation during the rainy season. This plan has worked out well. It's been very, very successful to use the grid intertie to our advantage and to the advantage of the local people because it improves the quality of service year round by having the national grid available at any time that there's not enough water or there are other technical difficulties in the hydro plant, the national grid <clears throat> is there to provide the service to the people. And during the rainy season, we sell about half of the hydro generation to the national grid. They pay us 10.5 US cents per, kil per kilowatt hour for the excess hydro generation. And that provides us with a second income besides the local distribution and sale of the electricity in the communities, which allows us, one, we paid a million dollars on a debt for building our projects, and we have funds for extending our grid. So we have, the system, our system has been growing since the end of December uh, 2009, we had 2006, hundred customers in in our system with the two hydro plants intertied and synchronized. Nine years later, we have 8,000 customers connected uh, with the same hydro uh, generators operating and purchasing more energy from the national grid. The second income uh, makes the project more financially sustainable. It has been economically very beneficial and the growth rate has been about 15% per year during these nine years. That's basically what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, while I still have you here on the line, may I ask you, um, may I ask you a question? Certainly. Thank you. So thank you for sharing with us your experience from Nicaragua. I understand you've been working there since 1984 um, and that there's a very, very strong um, element of the people working for the hydro um, power are from Nicaragua themselves. So I wanted to ask you a follow up question about the community aspect of the many hydro projects that you've been working on. Um, how has the community benefited and how are they involved? Well, as I mentioned, uh, we've increased to 8,000 uh, households and small businesses and farms that now have electric service. The electricity has permitted uh, improvement in the educational infrastructure. There have been lots of night classes added at the schools. There are now modern hospitals that depend on the electricity. There's cell phone service. Um, there's all of the electricity that the people may Sorry, I think we might have lost the need sound temporarily. For any business that they want to start up. Uh, we have a broad range of customers that range from minimal consumers of. There's a wide spectrum of customers here that go from the minimal connects to 12 kilos per month uh, with two light bulbs and one electric outlet in their houses to gas clean stations, cell phone towers, modern well-equipped hospitals that consume more than a thousand kilowatts per month. So this type of system 
is flexible for all levels of, of electric demand. The people participate uh, still, that is they, they worked very hard in the construction of the hydro plants when, the, when we were in the construction phase. Now they also work in the building of the electric lines whenever we get ready to to electrify a new community. The people come out and dig holes for the posts. They help put up the posts, uh, string out the cable science workers, uh, branches so that the right of way for the electric line, all with a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, everybody is excited about having the electricity. That's wonderful. Um, I'd like to ask you a follow-up question as well, just while we still have you on the on the line with a good connection. So my, my second follow-up question um, is since you have such an extensive um, period um, of work in this area, do you have recommendations for other projects that seek to involve community members? Other projects around the world? Yes, well, we start uh, at the very beginning of a project. If normally a community comes to us and asks us to carry out a project of a plant, we still do the very small isolated hydro projects for communities that are too far from our grid or from the national grid. <clears throat> and if the people are interested, this is shown when they come to request the project first. And second, when our surveyor and engineer go through the community to start looking for the resource to see whether there's enough hydro potential. Uh, he goes with people from the community who come out to with their machetes to go and clear a path and take a look at the streams, do the, the elevation survey and so forth. So it starts from the beginning that the people are showing us what their resources are. And from there, they form a committee which is involved in organizing the community for the work. This, this works in Nicaragua. I'm not sure about other countries. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I will now move back um, in our questions to uh, Chris Greeson, who was our first panelist. Hi, Chris. Are you Hi. there on the line? Hi, yeah, thank you. That's really fantastic that we were able to have uh, Rebecca here. I, I know you're excited about that. Um, so I just wanted to come back around to you and ask you a question. Um, you know, given that you've worked in so many different areas around the world, um, especially in Southeast Asia, um, but also a bit in Latin America and have been involved yourself uh, personally in the planning of the regulations for Tanzania's mini grids. Um, and given that, you know, you've published your new book, which we, we gave the link to there, um, we want to know what are what are some of the main um, the main lessons that you've learned across all these different circumstances and contexts, you know, in order to do things right in order to do things where they're going to be useful both to the community and to any of the people who you know governments uh, or private sector who've been investing in them what would you say some of the major lessons learned um, have been across your experience thanks that's that's a big question i guess first i should also um clarify that i haven't really worked much in latin america um, my work's been more in more in africa and southeast asia but in terms of um what what are important factors for success? I would say, well, <laughs> there's so many, it's it's hard to know where to start, but it's really important to have uh, a supportive regulatory framework in place that allows these projects to happen. I think in uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, a lot of the projects that were, were being abandoned simply because there was um, a, a rule on the books that, that made it that projects that had been built with government support and therefore were classified as government assets weren't eligible to be able to connect to the grid and sell electricity. And only recently has that been changed to allow these government 
supported micro hydro projects to be able to connect. But in a lot of cases, it seems that silly, uh, silly regulations um, that, for example, um, restrict uh, supply of electricity to only the national utility um, or that don't provide an, a, a mechanism for projects to interconnect uh, to the national grid or that have such cumbersome requirements that are really the same as large centralized power plants. Uh, those types of things get in the way of, of otherwise really uh, clearly beneficial um, projects being able to happen. So, so I would say one of the first things that's that's really useful is to is to have a supportive uh, regulate regulatory authority or or supportive government that's willing to put in place regulations that even let these things happen and happen in a streamlined way. And and if electricity is sold to the national grid, that that a reasonable price is, is paid for the electricity. An another thing that comes up often is that uh, it's quite difficult to obtain uh, financing. And um, Dipti, who's listening, I understand on, on this talk, has been doing some really good work in, in Myanmar, uh, working with uh, local banks to try to increase access to, f to financing on a tenor and with interest rates that are uh, what's needed for, for these types of projects to be able to interconnect. Um, I think th those are those are two main things that have that have come up. I mean, I, broadly, yeah. it's um, there's it, it, it's it's there's evidence that these are happening. Um, you know, Nicaragua, Indonesia, Nepal, Sri Lanka. Uh, there are projects that are interconnecting and 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 sync and uh, integrating well with the main grid. But unfortunately, a lot of mini grids are are being abandoned. But I, I think that that. Um, the kind of proof of concept is really there, so it's it's possible. It's just that a, a few things need be, need to be in place for it to happen. Okay. Okay. Good. And just while while I have you here, we did have a kind of a concrete question um, from William F in our audience, um, who was really interested in this topic of the small power distributor, um, the SPD, and he was wondering if you could just give a little bit more information about that and about what that situation is like. Mm -hmm. Well, where this is really happened in a big way has been Cambodia. And and again, it was because uh, the, the government had decided to focus its limited resources on expanding the, the medium voltage network. And, um, and there were already these mini grids that were providing electricity service to hundreds of, of villages. And, and, in, and in Cambodia, uh, the government has set up a program that provided both kind of a carrot and a stick to make this work. The stick was that it said, we'll only license um, projects, we'll only give you a longer term license for these projects if you upgrade the, the quality of your distribution networks, the poles and wires, so that when the grid does arrive, you'll be able to connect to it. But that at the same time, they provided the carrot in the form of, of uh, low interest loans and grants um, to make that uh, more possible. They also required that the that these uh, these mini grids expand uh, to cover service in in a whole designated service area. Um, this this whole process has required a fair amount of of regulatory. Uh, oversight. So there's there's a number of people, number of analysts that work at the regulatory authority that look at at detail at the costs of electricity service, um, the depreciated assets, and the operating and maintenance costs, and, and so forth for these companies. And on that basis, um, carefully regulate how much they charge for electricity and what level of cross subsidy they. Uh, receive. This is described in, in a lot of detail in that um, book that I linked to, the, the grid arrival one. Um, so in order to not take more time, I'd suggest have, have a look at that, that link, particularly the Cambodia chapter. 
Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, now I'm going to move over. I know we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I'm going to move back over to Janaid and Mafruda. Um, if you guys could come back online. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, let's see. Are you guys there? Sorry, I think I had put you guys on mute accidentally. Sorry, you're there now, right? Yeah, we are here. Wonderful, wonderful. So we, we have a question from the audience um, about uh, what are your experiences in applying the rules and policies developed to mitigate with the grid arrival? So I think this is going back a little bit to some of the, the challenges that, that you had listed about solar home systems and about uh, mini grids. Could you talk to that question a little bit, what your experiences are with the rules and policies to mitigate the grid, av grid arrival? Uh, so thank you, Molly. Uh, as our presentation has already identified that uh, uh, that there's a lot of scope uh, in Bangladesh to expand the solar mini grid project, and for that we have already collaborated with the government, uh, especially the power division, and we have come to an agreement that there must be some uh, area listed down where the grid expansion will not occur. Uh, in recent years. So uh, the government has already provided us with that list and even though um, uh, a few of, two, actually two of our projects have faced this problem that the location that they had selected for the mini grid projects are already connected to the grid. So in this case, so what we are doing is we are actually negotiating with the government that what should be the way out. Um, so what we are proposing currently is that the government buy electricity from them and to rate that the government has already mentioned in their policy that they will ensure the electricity is purchased and 15% uh, return is ensured for the sponsor. So I think our government has been very um, active and very responsive on this side and uh, the SREDA being an independent body of the government is also helping us uh, ensure that these uh, few of the such problems are um, uh, solved and the private sector is also encouraged and since the government has a very strong target to ensure that everybody has electricity access to electricity by 2020 so renewable energy has uh, been a potential source to ensure that uh, electricity can be reached in the very remote areas of the country. Uh, so policies, I would say, uh, so far uh, we haven't faced any significant problem because uh, they are very much open to negotiate with us and help the private sector uh, expand their investment in this sector, in this renewable energy area. Well, thanks a lot, Mafruda. Thank you for, for that. I think we have a question um, also from one of our other panelists here. Um, so this is from Chris, who, who we ju were just talking to. Um, his question is, has the government paid for any of these assets, um, i.e. on the buyout model? So uh, basically, uh, right now, uh, the, uh, uh, the project that's facing this problem um, so we are actually, um, we do not support this, that uh, the government buy out the pro asset of the project and gives away the salvage value to the sponsor. So we, what we are promoting is that the government should uh, buy the electricity from the sponsor and ensure that um, this, these projects continue because we also have a huge investment in this. And the donors, they have also invested a significant amount of grant and we have our loan portion invested in it. So we really don't want this project to be just... Um, you know, just being bought by the government and does not exist uh, anymore. So what we are trying is that it's sustainable and the government buys electricity from the project. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I want to say thank you to all of our speakers today. I know we've gone a few minutes over our time, so I want to say to the audience, thank you all for being here with us. Thank you for uh, being attentive and, um, and managing with us through some technical issues today. Um, I do want to remind you that there will be a small survey that pops up at the end of the webinar. So please, if you can take just another, it should only take you one to two minutes to fill that in. Um, that would be lovely if you could do that for us. And that way we have some, um, some feedback on, on how you perceive the webinar today. Um, so let me thank all of our speakers. Um, I'll just take everyone off of mute, or you can feel free to take yourself off of mute. I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time this morning or this evening. Um, thank you. Thank you all for having us. Uh, thank you all uh, for having us. And we're, we're really pleased to uh, attend the, uh, this panel. And hopefully, in future, we'll be also uh, a part of any of the webinars, uh, webinars uh, we'll be arranging. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you. It's been an honor to be part of this. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.
And I also like to thank in on behalf of Visions and um, apologize for the little technical problems. Um. Absolutely. And this is live on grid and off grid. Um, thank you for being with us here today. Um, and we'll hope to see you at our next webinar. Goodbye, everyone.